Hello, and welcome to the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute's 2022 Graduate Fellowship Program Capitol Hill Briefing Series. I'm Marco Davis, President and CEO of CHCI. This series is the culmination of CHCI's premier nine-month graduate fellowship program, which offers exceptional emerging Hispanic leaders on paralleled hands-on experience in public policy. This unique fellowship program seeks to enhance participants' leadership abilities, strengthen their professional skills, and increase the presence of Latinos in public policy areas, most notably in the areas of health, technology, housing, energy, social equity, child welfare, and education. CHCI is thrilled to be able to offer our graduate fellows the opportunity to share their perspectives on policy issues that they're passionate about and convene leaders in this work for an informative conversation. Now we'd like to thank our graduate fellowship program sponsors for supporting the program, including Facebook, the PepsiCo Foundation, America's Health Insurance Plans, BBVA, Casey Family Programs, the Walton Family Foundation, the American Petroleum Institute, DaVita, Wells Fargo, and CVS Health. You can keep today's conversation going by using the hashtag CHCI Fellows on social media. And please visit chci.org to learn more about our graduate fellowship program, as well as our other leadership programs and special events. And we encourage you to reach out to our fellows via LinkedIn to find out more about their policy work and help them connect with job opportunities for when the program concludes in May. Now let's get to the briefing. Enjoy the discussion. Good afternoon and welcome to day three of the CHCI Capitol Hill Briefing Series. I'm Caroline Gonzalez-Scott, Vice President of Programs at the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute. Today, we are excited to present our CHCI API graduate fellow, Angel Vallejos, who will be moderating a panel on an important topic related to the energy industry. Angel joined our program after completing his graduate degree in Latin American Studies from the University of Miami. Angel's research focused primarily on Nicaragua and the legacy of authoritarianism that has devastated the nation. Prior to attending graduate school, Angel was a community organizer in his hometown, Miami, where he worked on numerous campaigns with labor unions and local party officials. Angel has also done environmental organizing in the rural Northeast. A staunch believer in bottom-up organizing, Angel believes that we cannot solve the most pressing issues facing our underserved communities without including them in the conversation. It is my pleasure to introduce this year's CHCI API Graduate Fellow, Angel Vallejos. Thank you, Caroline, for the introduction. It was an honor to be offered a placement as a Graduate Fellow at CHCI. Your commitment to providing opportunities to Latinos interested in a career in public service is highly commendable, and I wish you continued success as you navigate the current political landscape. Welcome. My name is Angel Vallejos, and I am the current CHCI API Graduate Fellow. As Caroline mentioned, today we will be discussing a sensitive subject, and I invite the audience to participate in the Q&A. At the heart of today's discussion is the current trade agreement between the U.S., Mexico, and Canada also known as USMCA, and the proposed energy reforms in Mexico. Over the past couple of years, Mexico's president, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, has introduced proposed reforms to the energy industry, which favored state-owned enterprises over private foreign-backed companies. The most obvious risk to investors from Lopez Obrador's plan comes from the fact that it would cancel existing electricity generation permits and sales contracts. This would be the case for private actors, whether they are providing energy to the state electricity company, known as CFE, or satisfying their own energies, energy needs or selling excess electricity back to the grid. In addition to potentially violating Chapter 14 of the USMCA, which protects investors, it may also violate Chapter 22, which details the conditions under which state-owned companies must operate to guarantee good governance. These proposed reforms call into question Mexico's commitment to the USMCA trade agreement. Prior to AMLO's ascension to the presidency, Peña Nieto reversed decades-long precedents by opening the energy industry 
to foreign investors. AMLO's response? Well, he described this reversal as a, quote, betrayal of the homeland, end quote. The 1917 Constitution was a result of the Mexican Revolution and replaced the liberal Constitution of 1857. Article 27 of the Constitution of 1917 granted the Mexican government complete control of all subsoil resources. Following the labor unrest of 1937 and a failure of foreign businesses coming to an agreement with unions, Lazaro Cárdenas nationalized land owned by foreign interests in the energy industry. The move proved to be popular, as many saw Cárdenas as the Mexican leader that kept his word when it came to the promises of the Mexican Revolution. Following the 1938 decision to nationalize the oil industry, Mexico announced the formation of the state-owned Petroleos Mexicanos, or Pemex for short. The move was a result of the perceived view at the time in the region that the Colossus of the North viewed its neighbors to the South with contempt. The legacy of gunboat diplomacy, filibusteros, and the Bryant Chamorro Treaty had devastated America's reputation in the region. With the election of FDR and his New Deal coalition, the U.S. sought to change course in Latin America and offered the good neighbor policy as an alternative to past actions. These changes in American foreign policy are not incidental. At the time, America's priorities shifted from the region towards Europe. The U.S. believed that cooperation with Latin America on trade was a better policy going forward as they sought to minimize Germany's growing influence in the region. However, when AMLO took office in 2018, the world had changed drastically since the days of Cardenas. While Pemex continues to be a major source of revenue for the Mexican government, Pemex alone cannot, as structured, be a part of a solution to counteract the most pressing issues in the energy sector. While Mexico continues to raid Pemex coffers to finance the state, Pemex has lagged behind other industry leaders in investment in new technologies that result in cleaner burning fuel. In fact, the proposed changes to the Constitution will have an adverse effect on Mexico's stated climate goals. Much like other developing nations that have questioned the legitimacy of climate talks from nations that have historically contributed the most to greenhouse gas emissions, AMLO's decision to push for these reforms brings into conflict competing interests. AMLO knows that allowing for foreign investments gives Mexico the opportunity to slowly move away from fossil fuels and thus prepare Mexico for the future. On the other hand, he understands the historical context and the potential unifying value in propping up Pemex. Pemex is known for its unique corporate structure, to say the least. Uh, Pemex managers do not hire new workers. That privilege is extended to the union that represents Pemex workers. The union wields enormous amount of influence. In most oil companies, average employment at a refinery that processes 200,000 barrels of oil per day is 800 people. But a Pemex refinery of the same size and capacity employs more than 4,000 workers. While foreign investments will help funnel excess workers to other plants, the point of the reform is to highlight to the Mexican people that AMLO, and by extension Mexico, is pushing for a self-sustainable future. But will this last? Mexico depends on trade with the United States to help refine and export crude oil. Due to a lack of technological advancement, Pemex must ship its heavy crude oil to the United States, where it is refined, then imported back to Mexico, where it is sold internally, and in global markets. All in all, it is clear that if Mexico is to move towards a more efficient form of energy production, then foreign investments are part of the solution, not the problem. In this panel, we will discuss these issues in further detail. We have with us Andrew Colgan, who is a senior manager for tax and trade policy at the American Petroleum Institute. Andrew will discuss Mexico's current proposed policy reforms and its effect on the industry at large. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Colgan. Andrew? Hey, Angel. Uh, this is a pleasure to be with you all today. My name is Andrew Colgan. I'm the Senior Manager for Tax and Trade Policy at API. Uh, previously, I was at uh, a small lobby shop downtown. And before that, um, I worked on the Hill for uh, Ways and Means Chairman Kevin Brady. I did my graduate work at the London School of Economics, and uh, I did my undergraduate work in classics and economics at Dartmouth. Uh, at API, as pretty clear by my title, uh, I focus on tax and trade policy um, and as well as customs and uh, corporate accounting and finance. Uh, in the trade space, we API has 
been predominantly focused on free trade um, as well as opening markets, uh, et cetera. We were pretty, we were heavily involved in both Na in both the creation of NAFTA and its uh, successor USMCA. Um, and we uh, continue to view USMCA as an important tool in not only promoting regional energy flows between the US, Mexico and Canada, but also um, in providing uh, making North America a good counterbalance to both the European Union and uh, emerging powers in Asia like Russia and China. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Andrew. We uh, we look forward to uh, seeing your thoughts on uh, the issue as we get further in the discussion. Our other panelist is Santiago Solas Oliva, who is the Associate Manager of Government and International Affairs at the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. As a Mexican national, Santiago will provide his thoughts on the current issues in the energy industry and provide us with a quick snapshot view of how other young Mexican nationals think about this issue at large. It is my hope in inviting Santiago to speak that we recognize the need to bring those on the receiving end of trade deals into the conversation. In this increasingly interconnected world we live in, we must not hesitate to reach across and find the truth. Santiago, welcome. Thank you so much, Angel. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Well, my name is Santiago Salas Oliva. I was born and raised in Mexico City. I did a lot of work there around consumer product regulation. And I graduated uh, at the University of San Francisco with a politics degree, concentration in politics of transformation. And now at the US Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, I deal directly with issues relevant to the small minority owned business community in the US, as well as trade and international relations issues that affect the entire uh, US business community. Perfect. We appreciate your introductions. And I wish to begin this portion of the panel by asking uh, Santiago, is Mexico's youth a politi as politically involved as their Mexican-American counterparts? Uh, absolutely. You know, Mexico's civic society is very active in the country's public affairs. We have seen a rising level of engagement in the last couple of years, especially in young women. However, this engagement is slightly different to what we see here in the U.S. Uh, the activism does not typically follow the elections, like in the U.S. where you see young people volunteer to go canvassing. But instead, we see public demonstrations whenever a segment of the population feels that the government needs to address a certain pressing matter. Then we see massive engagement of people taking the streets to uh, get their voices heard. Perfect. And uh, how, how, do, how does Mexico's youth, or perhaps even just uh, regular Mexican voters, how do they view the USMCA agreement? Well, I would say that the young population is in favor of these types of free trade agreements where the market instead of the government sets the standards. Mexico went through major steps towards modernization when NAFTA was implemented in the 90s. Uh, Mexican consumers have greatly benefited uh, from competition between companies as they attempt to provide better value in products and services to their customers. That's why any steps towards a closed market are mostly seen as detrimental for our economy and our consumers. Perfect. Does energy factor at all in your decision making as a Mexican voter? Uh, what are some of the pressing issues that young voters in Mexico are thinking about? Yeah, well, Mexico has historically depended on Pemex and, you know, in every presidential debate, the question is raised as to what the best course of action is for that entity. You know, while the nationalization of our oil in the early 1900s really gave us agency and self-sufficiency to a certain degree, we are not married to the solutions of the past, and we want to see our leaders innovate uh, with their agendas and, and provide effective solutions to the challenges, the current challenges of our country and our society. Uh, I would say other than energy, some of the most pressing issues uh, at the moment are women's rights, you know, and a comprehensive government strategy to tackle on gender violence and discrimination. We have uh, corruption and accountability, you know, a need for a systematic change within our country's political machines. We want to see more merit-based merit candidates, less nepotism. And lastly, I see rising concern in Mexico's lack of innovation in the energy field. You know, while the rest of the world is taking strides towards a sustainable practices, we have not yet seen our government address this issue in the depth that we need. It, it's it's interesting you bring up that last point. Um, 
sometime last year, I believe in the fall around September, there was an explosion at a, uh, I believe it was an offshore Pemex refinery that unfortunately costed the lives of uh, five workers. And uh, I sort of wanted to get your take on whether or not uh, th this conversation happens in uh, in uh, Mexican media. Uh, are uh, reporters covering perhaps a lack of safety standards and uh, uh, the uh, other issues that might contribute to uh, unsafe working conditions like corruption? Is this a conversation that happens uh, regularly? I would say yes, but the conversation is mainly focused on how effective Pemex is because at the end of the day, they're providing uh, a resource that almost every Mexican uh, needs in metro metropolitan areas. So that the speech goes around effectiveness and corruption, not so much maybe health, uh, healthy practices, um, like the case that you're referring to uh, on the explosion. Right. So Santiago, in your opinion, why is AMLO proposing these reforms? What, what, does, what does he want to get out of this? Well, I think that um, the AMLO administration is trying to deliver victories to his voters in any way that he can. Now, there is a historical precedent in rallying around our country's institutions, you know, playing the narrative of abundance and resources and self-sufficiency. In my opinion, he's pushing back on all these fronts uh, and on all the reforms made by the neoliberals, as he calls them, uh, because this was the platform that got him elected. You know, his party is here to stay and they want to establish themselves as the founders of this new fourth transformation, as they call it. And so now they have to keep their constituents' mobilization uh, effective and they have to deliver what they promised if they want to keep a uh, clientele. They have to come through with everything that he's been promising. Uh, you know, he's been running uh, for president since 2005. So now that he's in power, he has to deliver on everything that he's been promising. Perfect. And do you see his base at all splintering? I know there's some uh, controversy in regards with uh, some some uh, developments that uh, the AMLO administration has proposed. For example, there's the the the, the airport um, that he wanted to, to to build. There's also the Dos Bocas refinery, um, and lastly, it's the Tren Maya, uh, which, uh, as you had mentioned in in our conversations, has provided a bit of a headache. Uh, can you go into a little bit of detail on like sort of the rift that's existing between AMLO, his base, and uh, developments, particularly Tren Maya? Of course. Well, the, the southern part of Mexico is not as uh, activated economically as the north, and so he's trying to activate that with this new project, the Tren Maya. Unfortunately, he's in a constant fight with the civic society and the opposition, and so there's our, our society is very much uh, splintered in half there's those who will support everything and anything he says you know they just uh inaugurated a new airport which is by no means uh the best or what we what we intended to have uh in the previous administration but there's people who are going to celebrate that victory in reality the neoliberals uh or the previous administration was pushing on innovation and opening up our market right with these energy reforms and AMLO is mostly trying to go back to the victories that we had in the past, kind of playing on that narrative of yeah, same self-sufficiency and investing domestically, but with resources and practices that we've been doing for a while. Um, and so there's there's these two sides. There's the ones who are, you know, uh, taking themselves, uh, identifying themselves with the victories of the past, and there's ones who want to see new things. They want to see. Uh, new ideas, and we want to do things differently. I understand. Uh, what are your concerns, if any, about these proposed reforms? More than anything, that Mexico is going to lose, you know, the track that we've been building on towards modernization, towards free trade with uh, with every other country. I feel like if we keep taking steps back into a closed market, into favoring our national institutions, we're going to lose the competitive edge against other countries, maybe in Latin America, maybe in the world. And so I'm just I'm just scared that all the progress that Mexico has been having these last couple of years, like that vacuum is going to be filled by someone else, by another country. So that's mostly uh, that's mostly my fear. Yeah, definitely. And uh, we see we're currently seeing now and I won't go into too much detail on this, but we're currently seeing the uh, effects that 
uh, industry, the, the energy industry touches a lot of a uh, lot of sectors of society, and oftentimes it's not really uh, visible uh, unless if you do some digging. Um, I want to loop in Andrew on this. Uh, Andrew, can you can you give a brief description of the situation? Uh, what are the proposed reforms, and why does it affect the American energy industry? Sure, thanks, Angel. Well, it's not just the proposed reforms; it's um, it also extends backwards to legislation that has already passed and regulations that have been already been instituted. I think it started shortly after um, <clears throat> USMCA was signed with delays and unfair treatment in terms of regulations and permitting for retail networks, uh, retail gas stations that were owned by uh, private companies and not Pemex. Um, and it's since uh, grown to include reforms to the hydrocarbons law, as well as reforms to the um, power industry law. And then there's also been a series of uh, regulate, regulatory decisions from SAT, which is the American version of the IRS, um, that have changed import and export permits, uh, and in some cases revoked them or ended them entirely for the import and export of hydrocarbons, both through via pipeline and again through uh, maritime facilities um, like uh, LNG export terminals, for example. Um, <clears throat> the, I'm sorry, can you, well, can, can sorry. you uh, clarify what LNG is? Sure, liquid natural gas. So it's natural gas that's been compressed into a liquid state, so it's, e it's easier to ship. Um, and because uh, obviously uh, you get more more gas in a smaller space if it's a liquid um, and so that's primarily uh so gas is shipped internationally via pipeline and or via lng through ships um and the the constitutional reforms more or less uh enshrine these change these changes that have already happened legislatively and regulatorily in uh, in the Constitution, as well as of course roll back the uh, the openings uh, the the opening of the Mexican energy industry to private investment. Perfect. And uh, what are so we you mentioned a little bit in your introduction about how your office has sort of worked with uh, on, on the formation of NAFTA. Uh, I wanted to get your your view on what are the key differences as it pertains to the energy industry between the USMCA and NAFTA? I think the key difference is this item called uh, or the ratchet clause, um, which essentially allows Mexico to open up its energy industry further to private investment, but not go backwards and close it off to private investment. This was also this was something that was initially negotiated as part of uh, TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was a regional agreement of Pacific countries to which Mexico and Canada are signatories, but which the U.S. is not, unfortunately. But that's a discussion for another time. Um, and so that's that's a kind of the key distinction um, is that that in and of itself, any attempts to go backwards in terms of uh, Enter, uh, openness to private investment in the energy sector is a violation of USMCA. Um, and then there's a very, uh, there's a variety of other the smaller issues. But I think the biggest charge that came from President AMLO is that the USMCA does not govern the energy industry, um, which is patently just untrue. Um, they, the the, there was an energy chapter that was removed from, from USMCA at, at the president's request, President Amlo's request, but the entire the agreement as a whole still applies to the energy industry. Perfect. And uh, w one, of the, one of the main points API touts is that Pemex fuel pollutes more than American standards, thus creating environmental degradation. Can you explain why this is the case? Why is it that if Mexico were to go through with its reforms that it would contribute to environmental degradation as opposed to uh, helping Mexico achieve climate goals? 
Sure. There's a couple issues here. I think first is the climate aspect. And one our industry, one of our industry's biggest investments in Mexico has been natural gas and natural gas generation. CFE, for example, is still majority fuel oil generation, which in terms of emissions is pretty high, uh, is pretty high up there, nowhere near as clean burning as natural gas. Um, but additionally, you know, this all goes back to why the reforms were instituted uh, in 2013 and 2014 is that just Pemex couldn't cut it. They didn't have the technology or the ability to uh, refine fuel as cleanly, as effectively as poss as the United States uh, can. And, uh, and it's not just the fuel itself, it's also all the other pieces that go into refining, that go into siting the refinery, et cetera, et cetera. Perfect. And, uh uh, I, I want to, I just thought about this. I want to jump back. You had mentioned uh, how these reforms uh, vi violate uh, uh, USMCA. Uh, I wanted to get your take on what is the steps to remedy this situation? Uh, how, how does the industry go about voicing its concern? Well, I think the first step in what we have been doing is um, raising these issues with the federal U.S. federal agencies and negotiators. Um, so we've had meetings, our industry has had meetings with USTR primarily, but also with, which is the um, Office of the Trade Representative who enforces and negotiates trade agreements. We've also had meetings with Department of Commerce, Department of State, Department of Energy, and the National Security Council, the White House, all of which are involved Dire directly or tangentially in this issue. Um, that's that's kind of the first step is is awareness. And the second step, I, I guess there's two there's two possible options. First is what we call a state to state dispute settlement, where the USTR, so Ambassador Catherine Tai, would uh, request consultations with Mexico to resolve these issues. And that would fall around issues of state-owned enterprises and designated monopoly. So essentially around the reforms Mexico has taken to promote Pemex and promote CFE and give them advantages over private investment. And so, that, um, so that's one tack. And that's our preferred tack. And that's called state-to-state -state dispute settlement. The other one is investor state dispute settlement. And there's a whole chat, several chapters in USMCA that revolve, that evolve around protecting private investment in Mexico. And so two companies uh, have already initiated ISDS claims against Mexico, Monteta Energy being uh, the one that's on the top of my head right now, um, essentially saying that you all inviolated, uh, violated our uh, the investment portions of USMCA and have made it impossible for us to operate our investments in Mexico. Um, and therefore, we'd like our money back, essentially. Um, the problem with ISDS is that it is long, protractive, expensive. And if you lose, you essentially have to um, be prepared to never operate in Mexico again. And so I think our companies are would like to pursue this state to state uh, dispute settlement system first. And honestly, that's it's a very strong case as well, just given the fact that the uh, the laws and regulations that have been uh, adopted by the Mexican Congress and the Lopez Obrador administration so clearly violate the state-owned enterprises sections of USMCA. Perfect. And uh, what what outcome do you hope is achieved? Uh, <laughs> I hope that uh, Mexico decides to stop uh, trying to pass the constitutional reforms and roll back the uh, amendments to uh, the hydrocarbons law, as well as the power industry law, and the other the other regulations uh, that have made it uh, made it difficult for our um, member companies and U.S. investors in general, because it's not just API; it's also um, a lot of renewable energy 
investments as well uh, that permit them to operate and deliver cleaner, reliable power to the Mexican people. Perfect. And uh, Santiago, I, wa I want to loop you in on this. I know that with your office, you sort of, you guys have also tracked uh, USMCA. And I sort of wanted to get your your view on uh, whether whether your office sort of sees that this might be an issue that might uh, lead into other industries. Is, is that a concern at the moment or? Um... I wouldn't say that we're anticipating this problem to go on other industries. We did identify this happening and we sent an advocacy letter to the USTR office, but we certainly don't expect um, this same issue of anti-competitiveness and favoring uh, domestic uh, institutions over others, uh, not complying with the USMCA. Perfect. And uh, I actually want to, while we're on this subject, I do want to bring up, somebody had posted on the comments section uh, a question, and I, I don't know, Santiago, if you would be able to answer this, but uh, what impact do Mexico's current energy policies have on the equitable distribution of resources and energy to urban households? Okay, let me see. Can you, can you repeat the question? I don't see it in the chat. Sure. Oh, yeah, sure. It's uh, what impact do Mexico's current energy policies have on the equitable distribution of resources and energy to urban households? I think the question gets at the heart of, uh, is there some sort of, uh, because it's a state-owned enterprise, does Pemex have some sort of a, a, a subsidized policy where they help urban communities have access to uh, energy to to uh, to satisfy their energy needs? Uh, you know, I I don't know that that these measures are going to affect the distribution of of these resources within the population. I would assume that they don't, uh, mainly because it's a it's a national owned. Uh, institution, and so there shouldn't be an issue there. Perfect. And uh, Andrew, you mentioned a bit about uh, investments in renewables. Uh, are you able to speak a little bit about uh, how that looks like um, as far as uh, foreign companies investing in Mexico? Sure. So in the same way that um, our members have invested in Mexico via retail networks, kind of uh, exploration and development in the upstream space, as well as, you know, building these uh, LNG facilities and pipelines. The renewable energy industry has also invested in uh, building renewable projects in Mexico. And right now, and so then they run the gamut from, you know, solar and wind to, to other more complex things. But the whole goal is that they deliver cleaner more reliable power to CFE for transmission to businesses and families in Mexico. And they're all part of Mexico's um, commitment, Paris commitments and DNCs, defined national contributions. And I think one of the big issues is that uh, a lot of foreign companies have invested in Mexico based off of the 2013-2014 energy reforms and the promise of uh, the availability of cleaner energy. And they these companies own commitments to reduce their emissions or to go you know net zero by 2050 or what have you. And so Mexico's um, moves now to move away from those policies and to move away from those investments in renewable private investment in renewable technology now will will alter all the complex internal calculations that these companies have made in investing in mexico and their uh global commitment to reduce uh emissions perfect and uh i we we have a couple of questions on workers and working conditions in mexico and uh andrew i wanted to see if perhaps you might be the person for this uh, Aaron in the chat wrote, what are the working conditions for Pemex workers and how do these conditions contribute to the overall health of the market? I I have no idea. <laughs> it's a good I'm question. <laughs> sorry. Um, I, I, I know we have, obviously, you know, OSHA regulates our, uh, the workers at our um, 
downstream at our refineries here in the U.S. And I believe there are most of them are also unionized as well. So there's we have strong worker protections in U.S. Uh, in U.S. refineries. Absolutely. And w- one thing I, I can say due to my background in uh, working with the unions, uh, uh, <laughs> we, we uh, the the industry here and in the states uh, in many places are actually union uh, are staffed by union workers which go through a rigorous training health safety standards and uh, while I can't speak to what happens in Mexico uh, there is a higher rate of uh, of uh, accidents on on the job uh, in in Mexico and that can be due to a number of things it can be uh, contractors. Uh, uh, skimping out on uh, good quality materials. It can be uh, it can be uh, employers not providing protective equipment. All those things sort of factor into how safe a job site can or cannot be. Uh, one of the things that uh, we we should be pretty grateful, and, and this is coming from a perspective of of uh, union labor, is that our unions in the states are actually in a position to be able to train adequately train and deliver uh, good working uh, employees to job sites. Uh, so that is something, uh, always a little plug there uh, for, for the labor movement. Um, but that is something that I think uh, we should keep in mind is that just because a job site is a union in another country doesn't necessarily mean they have the same standards, right? Uh, th- their, their labor movement might be set up differently. They might not take as much uh, uh, space in the political, in the political sector mainly because they just rely on possibly just uh, uh, hush hush deals, not rocking the boat. And uh, that sort of comes down into the into the working space. Um, There's a question here that I would like to ask Andrew uh, from Daniel. How do the changes at the policy level impact the individual consumer and how they can access energy and other resources? So I think one of the goals of, and I would say I'm not going to speak to the the minds of the the voters in 2013 and 14 in Mexico, but uh, one of the goals of those liberalizing reforms were was to provide better, cleaner, more reliable, and uh, power to both Mexican households and to businesses across Mexico, which they hope will obviously provide a better quality of life and um, and living for Mexican families, but also to encourage more foreign direct investment in Mexico now that they have more reliable power. Because I think it's quite clear at this point, and or I mean, it's the, the not so secret, dirty secret is that Pemex and CFE cannot provide, cannot meet the demand, energy demands uh, for Mexico, that those two two institutions alone cannot meet the demand for energy, either via fuels or via electricity. Awesome. Uh, Santiago, I think this question is probably best directed at you. Uh, what will it take for AMLO to reverse course on his proposed energy reforms? Do you see recent U.S. <laughs> concerns over those reforms or potential future U.S. actions affecting AMLO's decision making? Well. I don't. I wish I knew if there's a there's a way to make him pull back on all these reforms. I really don't see pressure coming from an international side affecting the decisions he takes with his team. I mostly see, you know, the idea of what he promised uh, his clientele and his constituents. He's addressing those needs. He's not addressing what the what the civic society is saying or what the government and you know, what the corporations are saying. So. I really don't know if there's anything that uh, that we can do as uh, international stakeholders to to put pressure on on reversing these uh, reforms. Andrew, I I assume you feel the same. Uh, yeah, I think up until the midterms, there was a reluctance on the part of U- federal agencies in the U.S. and the U.S. government to directly engage with uh, President Lopez Obrador on these issues because it sort of fed into the message he was selling his constituents that he was standing up to America and, you know, the rah-rah populism of his platform. Now that that's over, I think, and I hope 
that the that federal agencies are being a little more aggressive with him. But I think it's been our experience and understanding both via us in D.C. and via our members, uh, representatives in Mexico City, that, you know, backdoor diplomatic conversations aren't going to move AMLO uh, away from this, that the only thing that may have a shot at that is formal action by the Biden administration and formal intervention from the White House. Perfect. I'm, I'm glad you uh, I'm glad you mentioned the White House, because that segues perfectly to another question. A LinkedIn user wrote, Andrew, how will the Biden administration's recent ban on Russian oil impact Mexico's ability to fill that gap within the constraints of USMCA and its mandate for Mexico to reduce overall exports to the U.S.? That's that's a great question. Um, and so I think first thing to consider is that Russian imp crude imports into the U.S. were only a small share of total U.S. imports. Um, I think anywhere from three to seven percent, depending on the year you're, you're choosing. Um, and a lot there was no dependence on those imports. They were chosen because there was they were priced. Um, uh, they were priced attractively. Um, and so, you know, with the Russian oil ban, all our members have said, look, you know, we'll just, we'll make it work. We can get, we have to get, we'll get fuel from somewhere else. We can get fuel from somewhere else, just maybe a little more expensive. Um, and so that's can, that continues. Um, and so with respect to Mexico's exports to the U S I think it puts Mexico in a tough position because just generally the crude and gas prices have risen. And so in the U.S. as well as everywhere else. So they they're going to get a higher return on investment selling it into the U.S. That said, I am not an expert on regional uh, energy flows and midstream infrastructure. So I there and a lot of that plays into how and where Russian crude is used and where Mexico uh, crude and gasoline goes as well. So, for example, Russian crude was primarily used on the East Coast and on the West Coast, where a lack of midstream pipeline infrastructure prevented the um, crude, the WTI, West Texas Intermediate, that was extracted in the center of the country, Eagle Ford, Bakken, et cetera. It, it made it very difficult for it to make it up to the East Coast, to Delaware, Pennsylvania, New York, Massachusetts, and so forth. And so it was actually easier and less expensive for them to import uh, crude via ship than to get it domestically via pipeline. Um, I, so my point being that this is it's a very complicated, that's a complicated question with a complicated answer that I can only give you a partial answer to because I don't know how all those regional um, infrastructure uh, and, and pipeline infrastructure works. And so where where exactly in the U.S. the Mexican crude would go and how that would displace any Russian crude. Perfect. Thanks for that explanation. Uh, that's you, you learn something new every day. I did not know that the coast <laughs> were the major importers of Russian crude due to the lack of uh, midstream infrastructure. And the, for, for those who uh, who are not privy to the lingo of the industry. Andrew, would you mind explaining just really briefly what midstream is? So midstream are pipelines. They carry essentially rudimentary terms. They carry crude or natural gas from the extraction site from the wellhead to the refinery or processing plant. And so Perfect. that's how that's the number one way um, that and I work next to the midstream policy folks, so I hope they don't yell at me after this. But I believe that is the number one way that natural gas and crude is transported inside the United States. Other options being rail, car, and and, um, and truck. Perfect. And uh, I'm um, going to call this the the last question of the Q and A portion. How does the suggestion that the U.S. has a leg up on Mexico's capacity to transition? to a more sustainable, just energy future in the face of climate change stand if it is obviously challenged by the USA energy system, failures of several hurricanes, Maria, Irene, et cetera, and the Texas freeze last year. 
Um, I guess the question is uh, talking about how uh, how is it that the U.S. can say they can help Mexico transition into cleaner fuel if for some reason we're not doing that here, uh, I guess is the perception. Um, so I think, first of all, it's not the U.S. or the U.S. government saying that it can do the job better than Pemex or CFE. It's private industry private companies in the US and elsewhere. It's not just US and it's not just US private investors, but it's private investors elsewhere. Uh, I know there's uh, this some Spanish uh, companies have significant renewable investment in Mexico. And so there are these companies saying that we can develop renewable energy resources here and sell it directly into the Mexican uh, into CFE's grid. Um, so it's not the US um, saying that it's better or anything like that. Obviously, we have our own challenges here that we need to fix and we need to resolve. Um, but uh, a lot of those are on the government side of the issue um, rather than the private uh, company side. No, definitely. That that uh, that makes sense. And that's a great clarification, right? Uh, oftentimes, we, we equate uh, private industry with what the government is, right? And uh, I think we have moved past those days where uh, the senator from Michigan said, what's good for General Motors, it's good for America, right? I think we've we sort of realized that that's not the way things should operate, right? We sort of just let private industry speak for itself. Um, I, I would like to uh, I would like to switch now as, uh, to uh, closing remarks as we're getting closer to that time. Santiago, uh, would you, you have any uh, closing remarks for our guests uh, in the audience? Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm just going to wrap up by saying, you know, like I said, the country wants Mexico wants to see innovative solutions, uh, taking steps back towards a closed market is bad for the economy, bad for our consumers. And we can't keep doing the same things, expecting different results. You know, Bemex has been highly, highly inefficient for several years now. And at this point, you know, if, if the Mexican government and our energy providers are not going to solve their internal structural problems we want an open market so that consumers don't have to bear the burden of their inefficiencies and we can all benefit from a fair competition perfect andrew sure thank you um so i think i, I grew up watching the west i grew up watching the west wing i believe in free trade as not only being able to provide better goods and services to people around the world, households and businesses, but also that free trade in and of itself is a, a good, is a policy good. We see that now the with Russia and Ukraine, the closer, the more closely the world is tied together in terms of uh, commerce and economics and trade, the more harmonious they are and or the less likely they are to go to war with one another and so that's the space that i'm coming at from this is that free trade in and of itself is good but also the the liberalizing reforms and, and us andrew i'm sorry you could you and more reliable power to mexican businesses and families perfect Thank, thank you for that, Andrew. And uh, I, I quickly want to say that I'm glad you made that connection with how free trade actually helps uh, prevent uh, regional wars. Uh, one of the things that the European Union was actually founded on was uh, better trade relations between France and Germany, specifically with the uh, steel industry, which is obviously one of the main tools uh, to make weaponry, right? Uh, I want to I want to quickly uh, just add uh, some uh, closing remarks on my end. Um, I want to thank my panelists for taking time out of their schedule to deliver remarks about this timely sensitive subject. Your expertise and experience is greatly appreciated. I would like to give a special thanks to those in attendance uh, and, and thank you for your engagement on this subject matter. I hope this conversation sparks an interest in reliable energy solutions given the world events that have occurred over the past month. Uh, and I also want to give a, an extended uh, shout out to uh, my fellow cohorts at CHCI. Uh, over, this, over this past week and the next couple of days, you will be hearing from graduate fellows, but our program also has public policy fellows and uh, interns as well. And one of the things that I would like to say is that 
as a former community organizer, I am extremely uh, optimistic and excited about what the future has for our communities. Uh, there are a lot of young, bright kids with uh, great ideas on how to advance social equity in their home communities. And I hope you guys follow them and uh, look at the work that they're doing because they're totally uh, really cool game changers. Uh, so that's it on my end. Uh, I want to thank you for your time. I hope this was a veritable learning experience. And until then, have a good one.